Thumbs up. Excellent. Okay, well, it's about time, and it looks like it's a pretty packed house. So, uh, wow, hopefully I don't disappoint all of you. Um, going after Matt's is pretty intimidating, but uh, I guess I'll launch right into it since it's about time to start. Uh, so I'm here to talk about abstracting features into custom reverse proxies, aka making better lemonade from chaos. So what am I actually talking about? I don't know if that title makes sense to anybody else, but what I'm here to talk about are reverse proxies to start with. So just to make sure everybody's sort of on the same page with knowledge and you know, familiarity with everything, I first just want to lay out some basics of you know, what is a reverse proxy in case you're not familiar with what a reverse proxy is. Basically, a reverse proxy is a server that sits in front of your other servers uh, inside your internal network that sort of um, does stuff. It does something in between your main server and the end users on the internet. Um, so what kind of stuff does that reverse proxy do? Um, a lot of you in the Ruby community might already be familiar with reverse proxies. You might have already used one. Um, a lot of you might use Unicorn to deploy your apps. Um, and in that case, you oftentimes put Nginx in front of Unicorn, and that acts as a reverse proxy. So in that case, Nginx's role is to sort of serve static files and to deal with slow clients. So there, that's the role of the reverse proxy. But what I'm here to talk about is sort of taking that reverse proxy layer and doing other fun things inside of it. Um, you can sort of implement your own layer there uh, in Ruby. You can implement custom features. You can use Event Machine to do this, to do highly scalable reverse proxies. And that's a lot of fun. So that sort of is the outline of reverse proxies, but you might still be confused as to what this is actually all about. Um, so first, I'm sort of going to go into the why of why we've sort of built these reverse proxies and why they might be suitable for certain use cases, and then also get into a little bit of how you would actually implement this kind of thing. Um, so the easiest way uh, to get started is to start with a story. Um, and that story is um, sort of how we're using custom reverse proxies, and I think it's perhaps a story that you know, some of you might be able to relate to uh, in some way. So several years ago, we um, started building a lot of web services. Um, and uh, we wanted to expose all of our web services to the world. But another part of this story is silos. And I'm not talking agricultural silos with delicious coffee or sugar. Uh, I'm talking about organizational silos. So I work at NREL, um, at the National Renewable Energy Lab. It's just down the road in Golden. Uh, so I'm local. Um, yeah, <laughs> renewables. Um, <laughs> so NREL is a big company. It's, uh, I think, I don't know what the latest count is. It's grown a lot. It might be around 2,000 employees, something like that. Um, not all of us are developers. There's a lot of very smart scientists there doing very cool research on renewable energy stuff. Uh, but we do have a lot of sort of separate development groups within our organization. So, you know, our group that I work in, you know, sort of has historically done vehicle stuff while other groups maybe do stuff related to buildings um, and another group does stuff related to solar. Um, so we sort of have these different departments that all sort of work on different things, but we were all sort of wanting to build web services at the same time and sort of present those to the public uh, in a standard way. And another way to look at this is because we sort of have this uh, spread of groups and different, you know, different development groups throughout the lab. Um, you know, our group happens to do Ruby stuff. We have some other groups that do Python stuff. We have others that do Java, PHP, et cetera. So there's a big diversity there. So even if you're not working in a big organization, you might be able to relate to this um, from the perspective of you might have legacy apps that you're, you, you deal with. You might have, you know, a lot of, there might be different languages in your stack. Um, so there can be a lot of aspects to your stack, even in a smaller company. But from our perspective, we were dealing with sort of different departments and sort of we wanted to make all of our web services sort of come together. And um, so, and we wanted to present those to users as sort of a single offering. And really, users don't care about this kind of thing. I mean, they don't care that our group happens to do uh, transportation stuff and another group happens to do solar stuff. They're just interested in, hey, what does NREL have to offer? Uh, as far as web services go, and how can I most easily find them? 
So what we really wanted out of this uh, platform that we were building to expose our web services is we wanted one entry point for users to find all of our APIs. So we sort of wanted to bring um, together all these APIs that were being developed in separate groups in different ways um, and bring them together. And we wanted it to make it easier for the easy for those users to access the APIs. Um, we basically wanted to have the user sign up for one account and then they can access all of our APIs so they don't have to get an account from our transportation group to access the Ruby services and the solar group to access the Python services and so on. Um, and then from our perspective, um, on the development side of, you know, we have all these different groups building web services, we, um, we wanted sort of API key-based management um, to access all of our APIs across the board. We sort of decided that's okay for what we're doing. We were doing pretty public stuff. Um, we wanted rate limiting. That was something that a lot of our groups hadn't really explored or implemented within their individual APIs, um, but we, um, we wanted that. That was a need across the lab. And then we also wanted analytics. Again, another thing that you know, other groups hadn't really tackled, and it was something that we really thought we could you know, standardize and there would be benefits to doing that. So what we didn't want out of this were requiring changes to all of these different groups. You know, it's a, it's a big uphill battle to go into, you know, I mean, the one option is sort of standardizing for all of our APIs and saying it must be written in Ruby, which I wouldn't mind, but other people would. Um, and so, but we didn't want to have that mentality of saying you have to do it this way if you want to be part of our cool club of APIs. We just wanted, it's a big battle to make that change within different groups. And for historical reasons, you know, there are these separate groups. We're trying to do better to work closer together, but I'm sure you guys can empathize, hopefully, with sort of those big organizational structures. Or just, again, even if you're not in a big organization, sort of dealing with legacy apps and sort of this diversity even within your code base. Um, and it's also time consuming to have to go back and touch all of these other apps. Um, so, that's where customer versus proxies come in, uh, to the rescue. And so, what does this look like? So, if we look at our diagram again, it's um, at that same stack, at that level of the reverse proxy, um, we were able to implement custom features like authentication, rate limiting, analytics. Those are the things we decided we needed across all of our APIs, and then they can be shared among all the backend servers. So. Um, it sort of just slips in there without having to make any changes on any of the existing APIs that were already built, and it implements that common functionality. Um, the existing APIs don't have to change. They can still exist wherever they wanted to exist, um, and the proxy is just agnostic to what sort of backend technology is happening. Um, but it sort of provides that unification, that single entry point, um, to all of our APIs that makes it a lot easier to apply a standard authentication scheme across all of our APIs, um, do rate limiting across our APIs, um, and analytics. So um, that sort of is the basics of what we've done. So how did this really help us? Did this really make better lemonade from chaos? Um, so from the user perspective, I think it did. It helped um, our users. We were able to build one website uh, where users can go to and find all of our web services. Um, and they, can, they only have to sign up for one API key and they can get access to all of our APIs. Um, and so they're sort of shielded from sort of the internal, you know, they don't need to know which department does what and their home, you know, we have different web presences throughout the internet on various .gov domains. So they don't have to know where to find stuff. There's just a single website for renewable energy APIs that they can go to and start to find this stuff and it's easy for them to just dive in and start using any of them no matter what all is happening on the back end. And for our developers, um, the real advantage is that for old APIs, they had to do absolutely nothing. Um, you know, so we had an existing suite of APIs already out there, um, but they were all sort of all over the place, but they did absolutely nothing, but just sort of by existing, we were able to put them behind this reverse proxy, and then we were immediately able to start layering authentication, rate limiting, and analytics on top of it. Um, and the same goes for new APIs. Um, when somebody is building a new API, those are just things they don't have to worry about. They just sort of assume that all of that is taken care of when they're building a new API. And it's just outside the scope of it. They just say, if, if I'm being accessed, I'm assuming the user is fully authenticated. Uh, they're not, they haven't exceeded rate limits, and so on. Um, so that's, it, 
I think it's been also advantageous for us, just from a development perspective, of speeding up and not having to re-implement those same details, um, and so forth. Um, so yeah, so it's led to reduced implementation code because we don't sort of have to, um, individual APIs don't have to implement the same sort of logic over and over again. And you know, there are definitely ways you can abstract this, and there's definitely ways you can you know, reuse code in a clean way. Um, but it just reduces the need to do any of that. There's really no code involved to implement these features at the individual API level. There is code, obviously, at our custom reverse proxy level, but that's a little easier to maintain. And um, the nice also thing is that standardization is enforced across the board. You know, because we could abstract this into some sort of library and things could reuse it, um, but you know, we don't run the risk of somebody messing up authentication within their individual API. Um, by putting this sort of at a higher level, it sort of enforces that that's gonna happen. Um, so the other advantage is, is that because of how this operates at the layer that it operates, any new features we add to this reverse proxy layer benefit everybody. So you know, whether or not they're Python services, Ruby services, PHP services, Java services, uh, this architecture benefits everyone when we decide to implement new functionality. Obviously, not all functionality is suitable for this kind of thing, but it could be a powerful um, mechanism um, for certain types of functionality that can be layered like this. And another thing is that just reverse proxies in general are a nice scaling mechanism. You know, a lot of times they're just used, you use reverse proxies as load balancers. Um, so sort of having this in place and sort of getting everybody on board with this architecture of having reverse proxies up front uh, allows us a lot more flexibility on the back end to sort of scale things independently. Um, so that's sort of the basics of what we did. Um, on to how we actually built these things. So, um, you know, um, so yeah, how would you actually take Ruby and do some custom magic stuff at that layer and do it fast and efficiently? So um, currently we're uh, using EM Proxy. Um, it's a nice event machine um, proxy library and I certainly can't take credit for any of this stuff I'm about to show code-wise. Um, we're just users of it, but it's uh, open source, it's nice, it's easy, um, and it's out there. Um, so EM Proxy is Ruby and Event Machine and if you aren't familiar with Event Machine, it's uh, just sort of a event-based uh, system for writing Ruby code in an event way, so evented way. Uh, so if, you're, if you've heard all the stuff about Node.js, it's similar in architecture to that, but Ruby. Um, so it has some nice advantages of being blazing fast, it's also flexible, and it's low level. Uh, that low level aspect has its pros and its cons, but I'll get into the, that in a bit. Um, so it, a very basic example, this is sort of what an EM proxy looks like. So it's pretty basic, but you sort of, ha you set up a server, so this, when you run this script, you basically start up a server. In this case, it would be running on your current server, uh, listening to all the IPs, running on port 80. And then in here we say we're gonna proxy to the same server, 127.0.0.1, on port 81. And really that's all you need to do to do sort of a transparent proxy. But the real power of this is these callbacks that you can do. So you can, um, you have on data, on response, on finish, and I think there's even one other one. Um, but basically it gives you a lot of flexibility as far as intercepting chunks of data as they stream through the proxy and doing stuff with that. Um, so you can do something with as the data for the request comes in and then you can also do something to the response as it goes out. And then you can also do cleanup stuff on finish. Um, so as a quick example of what this might look like, um, this is an on data callback um, where I'm modifying the user agent. So the user agent comes in on the request and basically I'm just doing a search and replace, replacing any existing user agent uh, with the user agent of EM proxy. And you'll note that um, I'm doing a search and replace but again, you're dealing with sort of chunks of data. You're dealing with sort of the raw HTTP uh, at the raw HTTP level here. So you have to be a little careful, um, but you'll see here that I'm actually searching for user agent and then uh, and two new line characters that is how the HTTP headers work. Um, so there's some things you have to be aware of. It's not quite all simple, but um, 
The other thing to note is that you're dealing with chunks of data in this case, so you're sort of, you're getting a stream of data as it comes through in chunks. So you can't always assume that you have like, say, the full request in here. Um, so you can't just do a search and replace and assume you have all the data. You sort of have to deal with, there's other things and I'll get into a bit of that. Um, as far as buffering things, if you need to have the full request. Um, so that's all well and good, but you could do that kind of thing with, you know, uh, any sort of reverse proxy, or most of them, to do sort of a change the user agent. That's pretty basic. Change a header, do something like that um, in the, at the reverse proxy layer. Here's something that, you know, now, because this is written in Ruby, you can start to tap into all these Ruby libraries. So that's the real advantage of sort of this approach um, and implementing custom stuff. So here's an example of I'm setting up, I'm connecting to Redis, and every time I get a chunk of data, I'm incrementing um, the IP address. I have a counter for that IP address in Redis. Um, so again, this is a little taste of what you can start to do because it is Ruby. You can just sort of start to write things and access your uh, Ruby libraries, and it can be a lot of fun. Um, and as I mentioned, you're sort of dealing at a low level here. Um, you know, you, you basically have raw HTTP strings. Um, so if you want a higher level interface into HTTP, it sort of is up to you to do that yourself. And there's libraries to do that, uh, and here's a very quick example of sort of as you get data on data, so chunks of data are coming in, you pass that to this HTTP parser library. And then once it's determined that all the headers have uh, read in or there's other callbacks on the HTTP library, you can then, once the headers are completely read in, then I am accessing that user agent header as a Ruby hash. Um, so this is sort of, if you want that higher level interface into the HTTP request, you sort of have to do that yourself. Um, but there are libraries to do that kind of stuff. So you might be asking, why would I do this? You know, this sounds sort of like a pain to be dealing with, you know, things at this low of level um, and having, um, having to, you know, deal with stuff like parsing HTTP yourself. You know, we're, a lot of us might do web development, a lot of us might be used to, you know, nice high level frameworks like Rails and Sinatra uh, and things like that. Uh, and so there's a few reasons why you would go down this path. A big reason is transparency. Um, at this reverse proxy level, at this proxy level, implementing it this way, you are dealing with the raw HTTP request, but that gives you a lot more flexibility to sort of um, pass that request on to the back end in a completely transparent manner. So it's not apparent that, um, that there's something in there in between uh, doing something, because if you, if you would try to do this with something like uh, Rack or uh, Rails or Sinatra, by that point, by the time your application has been hit, uh, the web server has already taken in the HTTP request. Um, so it becomes difficult if you then want to recreate that HTTP request to send it to a backend. Um, because by that time, you don't really have access to that raw, low level stuff. So it can be hard to sort of, you sort of have to manually try to reconstruct the request. And there's a lot of, you know, edge cases with HTTP stuff that it makes that hard to deal with. Um, so the other reason why you would do this is purely just speed and efficiency. You know, the higher level frameworks are great. We use them a lot. Um, but at this kind of level, you know, we really want things to be very fast and very efficient uh, and scalable. And event machine is very fast, um, and evented systems are very suitable for proxies. That's why you see a lot of proxies being built in Node.js. This is similar in concept. Um, they scale nicely and efficiently. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, I'll throw up some terribly unscientific benchmarks. Um, just to give you a sense, um, I just ran these on my computer. There's probably lots of things going on here. But the basic thing is that uh, basically, I benchmarked making a direct request to a backend server, and then making it through EM proxy, event machine proxy, and then making it through a proxy I just found, I didn't know much about it, called Rack Reverse Proxy, that basically does take a higher level approach to proxy, and you have a lot of nice access to sort of the parse HTTP request. Um, so in this case, I mean, it's already fast, it's one millisecond. Um, EM proxy adds 0.5 milliseconds, Rack Reverse Proxy adds almost three milliseconds. So, I mean, three milliseconds, maybe not the end of the world. Who really cares? Um, it starts to get a little, the picture becomes a little more complicated once you start to get into bigger requests. And this, 
is partially determined by your needs. Uh, and so here's an example of a larger request where there's more data involved. And here EM proxy adds 150 millisecond and rack reverse proxy adds 800 milliseconds. Um, so why this is the case is that Rack sort of deals with a complete request and complete response. So it sort of takes in the full request, then it tries to recreate that and send it to the backend server, gets the response from the backend server, and then sends it along to the original client. Um, so it sort of has to buffer all of those in memory. Um, so you know, if, if you can imagine that you're uploading a one gigabyte file through some web service and you need to download five gigabytes. I mean, that's a lot of data, but there are cases where this happens. Um, with rack reverse proxy that sort of is bottlenecked at that and it would read that into full memory each, at each step. And again, there are ways around this, but it sort of is, the difference is EM proxy um, deals with things at a chunk level. So you're sort of dealing with just chunks of data at a time and you can just stream them on to the back end as fast as you're receiving them. So as soon as you have enough information you need to uh, have to make your decisions, that you wanna do inside your custom reverse proxy, you can just start streaming that data very quickly and then stream the data back. So there isn't that required buffering. And so that sort of gets to another aspect of this, which is just flexibility um, of EM proxy. And in line with that, um, you know, it's low level, but, um, and it's up to you to implement more, but it's up to you to decide if you do wanna implement something like buffering or if you wanna stream everything live. Um, and another thing you can use EM proxy for is non-HTTP things. So you could use it for sort of any TCP level uh, thing. So you could do it with, uh, I don't know, web sockets, mail servers, uh, database protocols. Uh, you can sort of put it in the middle of anywhere and um, any of those sort of types of connections and potentially do custom things. Um, so what else could you sort of do with these custom reverse proxies. I've talked a bit about you know, what we did as far as uh, tackling some of our issues with APIs um, and you know, implementing authentication, rate limiting analytics. And you know, I think those are all really good candidates for something that could be implemented at that level. You know, because you do have to be careful. This, you, know, you can't really implement your, it's not suitable to implement your whole application at this level, but it sort of is those high level features that you, know, you might have potentially diverse backends or even if you don't have diverse backends, it could be an interesting, different way to structure your application. Um, so what else could you do with this? Um, I don't really have any concrete uh, examples, but I'm just throwing out ideas here. You could do error handling. So you know you could monitor all requests coming back for a non-success uh, HTTP code, and then you could do something with that. You could log that, you could send emails, um, and you know, a lot of us do that within our Rails apps, but you know, if you're maybe dealing with, we have legacy Perl applications, I'm ashamed to admit. Um, but we have to deal with that, and you know, we don't sometimes have those mechanisms to deal with sort of that error handling in the same way in those applications. But you could sort of slip in something that deals with all your errors across all of your applications, no matter how they're written. And again, there are pros and cons. You might not have access to all the debug details at that level, but you could certainly you know, be notified about requests that failed. Uh, you could even do this to sort of manipulate web pages. Um, you know, say you wanted to insert your Google Analytics snippet on all of your pages. You could actually do that with a custom reverse proxy. You could sort of take the response as it's going back, sneak something in there. Um, you, know, you could even do crazier stuff with like, uh, taking all your JavaScript files, compressing them on the fly, and then returning it as one JavaScript file to the client. And we do that in Rails, but again, if you have diverse backends that maybe don't have those capabilities, you could do that at a higher level. Um, you could you know, maybe do your template in uh, your web page template. Put in a header and a footer. I don't know why you do it at this level, but you could. Um, you could also do things like, say you had a, a bunch of JSON APIs already, and you know, maybe you can't touch them for a variety of reasons, but you wanted to add JSONP. You could sort of add that at this level, and then all of, because JSONP is just sort of a matter of wrapping an existing JSON in a callback, you could implement that at this level by altering the response as it goes back, and it would apply for all of your existing uh, services. You could do things like check for security things, see if incoming requests look malicious in any way for all of your servers, do stuff like that. And again, you can sort of do more than HTTP with this. You can intercept, uh, 
and sort of manipulate all sorts of TCP things. So you could do email, database calls, all sorts of fun stuff. And there's a lot of great examples in EM Proxy's uh, GitHub repo. Um, there's an examples folder just filled with sort of interesting ideas of what you could sort of do. So again, I don't want to take credit for any of this stuff. This is sort of us just repurposing a lot of this stuff. Um, so there are a few things to be aware of um, when you're building these. Um, as I've sort of hinted, one of them is buffering. Um, so, and again, I've already sort of talked about this, but imagine you have, you know, one gigabyte upload and a five gigabyte download. If your proxy layer buffers that request, that becomes sort of a, um, sort of a bottleneck, but it also becomes a place where as the request gets uploaded, it all has to halt until it's fully uploaded and then it gets sent on to your backend server. Uh, and in the case of a one gigabyte upload or a five gigabyte download, that buffering can add significant delays. Um, and so sometimes buffering is desirable though, and sometimes you can't achieve stuff without buffering. Um, and you know, for example, Unicorn actually wants buffering to deal with slow clients. So it can be advantageous, but other times it's not. And in our case, we're, we're dealing with a diverse set of APIs that we don't really know the use case of all those APIs. We opted not to buffer because we just don't know what all those backends are doing or if they wanna stream data, and we didn't wanna prevent that streaming from happening at our proxy level because we just wanted to be as transparent as possible. Some other things to be aware of um, at this reverse proxy uh, layer is that if you are gonna modify the response going back to the client, um, you can do that, um, but it can be a little tricky. Um, you, in the header uh, going back to the client, there's usually a content length um, header, and you have to adjust to that accordingly if you're gonna do any manipulation. So again, this isn't the easiest way to perhaps alter your website, but for certain use cases, I think it can be powerful. Um, and in line with that, another thing to be careful of is uh, gzipped responses going back to the client. So if your backend server decides to gzip something up, send it back to the client, um, if you wanna alter the response body in that case, it gets tricky again, because you sort of, you do have to buffer in that case, because you sort of have to get the full gzip, then because you can't just gzip the different, ungzip the different chunks. You have to get the full response body, um, buffer it, Un-gzip it, do whatever you were wanting to manipulate, and then re-gzip it and send it back to the client. Um, so those are just some things to be aware of uh, that we've just sort of learned as we've gone through this process. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some other stuff. So this is all well and good, but um, our, I don't know if you're interested in bigger stuff. Um, so uh, this uh, digital strategy for the federal government came out uh, earlier this year, May 23rd, 2012, apparently. Um, and so uh, I'm involved in the API portion of sort of some of this digital strategy. And a big part of this digital strategy for the entire federal government is just a web services bonanza. I mean, it's just like, everybody should be doing web services. Web services are great. Uh, all agencies should be you know, delivering data um, to people in the form of web services. And I, I would tend to agree with that. I mean, I think, uh, you, you know, as app developers, it's always nice to find data out there that's just in an open web format, uh, in an API that's easy to use and get access to. Um, and, you know, the government has a lot of data, um, but it's not always in the most easily accessible format. You know, I've seen stuff where it's like, it's a printed Excel spreadsheet that's been scanned in and then put into a Word document, and then they just give that to you. And it's like, I'm providing data, not really. Um, so a big part of this push for this federal strategy is to encourage agencies to develop a lot more APIs uh, and web services. So expect that sort of within the coming year to see a lot more uh, government data out there. So that's exciting in of itself. Um, but the portion that I'm involved in is sort of the API thing, and um, sort of the main objectives there is, you know, there is this big push for web services, um, but they sort of want to tackle two things. On the one hand, they want to make it easier for users, um, uh, like a lot of you, to find and consume federal uh, APIs. There are some out there already, but a lot of times they're not easy to find. You know, you might be interested in some data, but it, it's just hard to find through the bureaucratic websites that are government websites. Um, and the other aspect of this is that if they are pushing agencies to develop more APIs, um, they, 
they need to make it easier for agencies to develop and deploy more APIs. Um, so, you know, if there's this big push for APIs, it just needs to become easier. A lot of agencies, you know, a lot of them are ahead of the game and they're already building APIs, they're doing great work, but some of them are sort of, they need help with this kind of thing. Um, so in a lot of ways, this is the exact same problem we had within our organization at NREL, um, just a, on a much bigger scale. Um, you know, there are silos of organizations, uh, there's different agencies that are all doing things independently, um, but a lot of the stuff that needs to be addressed um, are similar issues. Um, so it sort of mirrors our same problem. So what we're looking at right now is, is it sort of the same solution? Um, we're currently evaluating um, using um, basically our software stack that we developed at NREL to sort of uh, proxy to all the agencies uh, within the um, federal government or possibly other solutions that sort of do similar things. Um, but we've been talking to a lot of different agencies and the consensus was they want something like this. They don't want to have to deal with authentication on their own. You know, they want, and from the federal level and from a user level, they want to make it easy for users to just get one API key and to be able to generally access all the federal APIs so that you don't need to have a bajillion accounts for all the different agencies. Um, so. So yeah, I mean, it's sort of the same issue, sort of I, perhaps the same solution. And so, um, yeah, we're currently involved in getting something like this up and running, perhaps within the next six months, um, for federal agencies to start taking advantage of. Um, so that's all exciting. Um, there's lots of federal, um, um, there's lots of web service action going on in the federal government over the next year. So stay tuned if you're at all interested in all that. Um, so, uh, I'm starting to wind down here, but I have some more slides to go through. Um, so what has all this been about, really? Um, so to sort of summarize, um, you know, what I really want to encourage here is sort of a different way of perhaps thinking about some of your architecture. Again, I, reverse proxies can't solve all problems. They're not suitable for all problems. But I think they can be an interesting different approach that I don't see utilized as much to solve certain problems. Um, because they're fun for the whole family. You know, anything you do within the reverse proxy layer affects all of your uh, backend applications. So as you start to add new features to your reverse proxy layer, uh, it can be advantageous for everyone. Um, so it's an interesting way to sort of abstract things completely outside of the application level uh, into a higher level that sits in front of all of your applications. Um, and you know, what I want to encourage you here is you might be able to do more with reverse proxies than you realize. You might think of a reverse proxy just as you know, a software like Nginx or HAProxy that sort of just does proxying, but there's not a lot of logic that can happen in there, um, or rather like implementation details that can happen in there. But since you can write these in Ruby, you can start to leverage all these libraries, you can connect to databases, you can do all sorts of crazy fun stuff at that level. Um, so yes, again, just sort of think about it as a different way to perhaps architect some of your applications. Um, so I'll go through some just random resources um, that might be useful. Um, one of them is API Umbrella. This is our full um, API management system we've built at NREL, and we've just recently finally got approval to open source it. So it's all out on GitHub. We're super excited to finally open source the project. Um, and it includes our custom event machine based proxy. Um, so um, you know, even if this is, even if you're not interested in APIs, you might check it out as, you know, what you can do with, um, um, uh, what you can do with that reverse proxy level and how you would implement some of those details. Um, so it's GitHub slash NREL slash API umbrella. And it's a new open source project for us, so we're sadly behind the times as far as getting it all documented and everything, but definitely reach out to me if you have questions about any of that. Um, as far as just Ruby and Event Machine, just low-level proxies, there's EM proxy, which I talked about, and those are the examples I've shown. It's just sort of a simple, bare bones, but very capable reverse proxy. Um, there's Proxy Machine, which is actually what our current production system is based on. Um, it's a GitHub project. Um, it's simpler, uh, the one, and, uh, and it can be easier to get started perhaps, but the one disadvantage is it can only act on incoming requests, it doesn't track the response going outwards. So it sort of just does incoming stuff and then does routing, it doesn't 
keep track of the response coming out. So you can't keep track of some of the stuff you can in EM proxy. So we're currently in the process of switching over to EM proxy. Um, and then there's Goliath, um, which is another thing um, that's based on all this event machine magic. Um, and it's uh, more of a sort of higher level framework. It still is pretty low level, but it um, then uses EM synchrony, which uses some fiber stuff. So you ac it actually hides all the event stuff from you. So that's an interesting project to also check out. Um, as far as just general reverse proxies you might be interested in, uh, we use, there's a lot of them out there. This certainly isn't exhaustive. These are just sort of the ones we use in variety of capacities. There's HA proxy. HA proxy is amazingly fast and scalable and it can do all sorts of fun load balancing stuff and it acts as a great general proxy. Uh, Varnish cache is an interesting one. It's a reverse proxy but it also is a caching layer. And so that sort of gets back to sort of we're actually gonna be adding this to sort of our stack. We're gonna slip this in as another reverse proxy in our stack. And then the advantage there is that some of our older APIs that maybe don't have as good of caching capabilities as some of those stuff built into Rails does can start to use the Varnish caching server as a caching layer. And Varnish is nice just for caching all sorts of stuff. And then there's Nginx, which is really more of a, a web server, but it also has some pretty nice um, proxying capabilities. It isn't um, as exhaustive as something like HA proxy, but it, if you're already using it, it can do quite a bit of stuff. Um, and so if you happen to be interested in renewable energy APIs, this is our site that we sort of built um, that um, sort of, this is what this was all about, is sort of making one website for users to find all of our APIs, even though they happen to be on all sorts of different servers within our organization. Um, and so you can check that out at developer.nrel.gov. Um, and there's lots more APIs coming soon. Some of my colleagues sitting down here in the front are working hard uh, away at building new APIs. So there's a lot of cool stuff in the pipeline. Uh, and so those are some contact details for myself. Um, I don't really use Twitter. I'm sort of a curmudgeon, but feel free to contact me. Maybe I'll start using it. Um, and finally, this is a completely off topic and a shameless plug, but uh, if you've been wondering about this ridiculous thing on my upper lip, uh, we just finished our mustache competition at work this week. Um, and we have a mustache competition every year for charity. Um, and so we haven't met last year's goal, um, but if you're interested, it's a local Denver-based charity uh, to help support kids and education resources. Um, so if you're interested, uh, bit.ly slash ruby stash, uh, you can donate. Uh, but anyway, I think there's actually some time for some questions because I was cooking. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's a great topic, thank you for sharing. Uh, I have a question, how do you deal with inter-services communication? So if one department needs some information in one other department, do they go through the proxy as well? Yeah, so for everybody else, the question was, uh, how do we deal with sort of inner pro uh, process communication? You know, so if one web service needs to call another service, does that travel through the reverse proxy as well? Uh, and the answer is, in our current system, yes. Um, it isn't strictly necessary. On the back end, we definitely could communicate directly server to server if we wanted to save the overhead. Um, but I will say, this reverse proxy is very fast. I mean, it, in benchmarks, I think it adds like four milliseconds to deal with the, uh, 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 rate limiting uh, and analytics and user authentication and that utilizes Redis and MongoDB to do all that. So it's fast, so for the time being, uh, we haven't really seen any problems with routing those sort of inner service uh, communications through the proxy and that sort of just gains us some advantages as far as analytics mainly, just because we're interested ourselves to know internally how we're using our APIs. Yeah. Sorry, just to segue, so how do you deal with off that you have the concept of sessions, or how does that work? So the question was how to deal with authentication then? Yeah, so we still use the same, uh, our authentication is admittedly very simple, it, it's all API key based, so it's just a big long API key, and then on the back end we have capabilities to um, uh, remove the rate limits from certain API keys. So basically we set up those back end things as unlimited API keys. So we have API keys that we send back and forth and that's what we use for authentication and that sort of identifies each app. So again for analytics. Yep.
Hello? How do you deal with the fact that your the pattern, the text you're looking for may be split between blocks? Do you have a facility to buffer adjacent blocks or something like that? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So for the first part of that question that you might have missed was how do we deal with sort of sense things are coming into this proxy as chunks. And you know, if we're doing something like a regular expression, how do we make sure that it doesn't span chunks and we don't have that data? So the answer there uh, is, first of all, I wouldn't really recommend doing regular expression searches sort of for that reason. That was sort of a very simple example. Um, but that is why you would use a higher level library like that HTTP, HTTP parser library that then is capable of knowing when all of your headers are read in, and then you can take some sort of action on the, all the headers, or once all the body is read in. But you're right, I mean, in that case, you do sort of need to buffer, and that's why if you're doing anything with the response, um, you, the, there are some ways you can get around it for very specific cases, but for the most part, if you're dealing with the response, um, you have to buffer, and then if you're incoming request, sort of the same deal, um, if you want to do anything with the body, um, and yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, you can take a look at our GitHub repo. It's probably not as well tested as it should be. Uh, so yes, there are, um, I mean, I would say, I would say slightly, yes. I mean, we, I would say the testing right now tries to break it down on a, um, it doesn't really get involved in the event machine sort of level. It sort of is just testing the more basic blocks within there. Um, so yeah, we're probably lacking on tests for sort of the whole thing running as a whole with all the events going crazy. Um, so yeah, testing is more of a challenge with event machine stuff. Any questions? Yeah. yeah, you mentioned about HA proxy, large cache, and internet for proxies. Why not Apache does not do this much at all? Apache does do it. Um, yeah, and Apache can be used. I would say it's probably not as scalable as a lot of these other solutions. Um, it depends on how you're running Apache, whether or not you're sort of the, it's been a while since I've used Apache, but the worker model versus the other model, whatever that is. Um, um, by default, Apache will sort of spin up new processes for every single uh, request, whereas I think all of these other ones, uh, HAProxy and Nginx at least are event-based model, so they're a lot lighter weight. Um, so Apache will work. Um, the other one's possibly just a little more scalable. But again, if you're already using Apache, go for it. I mean, I don't want to tell you not to use it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, um, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, the question was, uh, uh, the previous question, I don't know if I repeated that, was about using Apache, if you couldn't pick that up. This question was about how we deploy uh, our uh, proxy and if we deal with any sort of uh, missed requests or any of that. So to deal with deploying, um, we, uh, all of our deployment stuff runs through Capistrano, but within that, how we're really deploying that and dealing with that issue of, uh, we do basically do a rolling restart. Um, all of these, we basically run, I think, three of these processes or four of these processes. It sort of is the same model as Nginx where you run as many as, you know, cores as you have on your CPU. Um, so we have, you know, several of these processes running and then we do do a rolling restart. We do that through a Python project called Supervisor. Um, it's a pretty nice library, just, it's not really Python related at all, it just happens to be written in Python. Uh, but it's a nice um, process management library. Um, that you can deal with sort of treating things as process groups. Um, I know a lot of people might use like Monit and I think there's some other blue pill, God. I think there's a few other of those. Uh, I've, we've been, I think, probably more happy with Supervisor. Uh, and you can do, so. we basically do, uh, we did a custom implementation of a rolling restart with Supervisor. So we stop one and start another. I think there might be some edge case stuff where if somebody's in the middle of a request, I'm not sure if we're completely gracefully shutting down right now, but I think actually part of proxy machine and EM proxy does, should handle graceful shutdowns. So theoretically that should happen without any lost requests. Any other questions? Oh, what perfect timing. Uh, well, thank you guys very much. Uh, I hope this was okay. <laughs>